All right, all right, all right. Welcome to this twenty-first episode of Warrior Week, the podcast. Parables from the Pit. My guest today, Michael Wedeman. Michael, welcome to the show. Hey, Coach. Graduate of Warrior Week thirty-seven, the original New Bloodline. We were the first. The first. The guys that actually forced everybody else to go through Warrior Week for a second time. We did. It was uh, <clears throat> coming in. It was you know we didn't know what we were getting into, but we've heard stories that it it made a big shift. All right. So welcome to the show. Sit down, relax, and enjoy this parable from the pit. All right, man. So life is happening. Life is taking place. You come across the message of warrior. Talk to me specifically when, how long ago, and what hit you in the fucking face. Well, I have a bit of a unique story, <clears throat> um, which is good because that's me. I'm unique. It was exactly May 16th. 2017 I walked in to my apartment and at the time I well my fiance now Letha um, we had been together for about three and a half years and I walked in that day and I walked in the kitchen and I told her that I had just rented another apartment and that I was moving out and that we were done and now you would think that in that situation that most people would be up in arms, you know, pissed off or a big fight would, you know, come up. Yeah. And it wasn't that it was, she kind of understood, you know, she just, she got it. We've been fighting for three years and it just hadn't gotten any better. And she did this incredible thing. She, she stayed calm and she walked into our bedroom and she came out and she, she had an envelope. Mm. and she put the envelope on the counter and she's like this is supposed to be for your birthday in two weeks or three weeks but I think this is what I'm supposed to give it to you and it was a ticket to WarriorCon holy balls yeah she's like I think you should go to this I think that I think that Garrett can help us so she she bought the ticket to come for you to come to WarriorCon she knew we were in a bad was spot. Was it con one or two? One. Man. Dude, I kind of forgot about that fucking story, bro. It was insane. It shifted our lives. Kind of make me think that we should have her here instead of you. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So you get th you get this, and do, do you have any idea what the fuck this is? What is Warrior Con? Or what is this ticket? I didn't know what the ticket was. Yeah. I, we had met Garrett about three years prior. Really? Okay. Um, in this random thing we were doing in Arizona, he came out and taught two days yeah. at, at an event we were doing. So I, I saw him for two days. and Was that a real estate event? It was. What, was AZ Araujo there? Yeah. Okay. So yep. that's that. Okay. So he was there. You were part of the audience. Shane Saunders. Um, no, I was actually the host. Oh, you were the host? Yes. Uh, okay. You were the host. And then... Uh, and then and so he came in and he was one of the guests. Garrett was our first instructor. So we, we had these 24 realtors that were, we're going to have this apprentice-like challenge type reality show. Okay, okay. And so Garrett was our first instructor. Got it. And so we got to watch Garrett literally in, in over two days, but probably six hours, uh -huh. take these 24 people and just radically change their lives. You know, you know what he does. It was beautiful. Amazing. Okay. So then she was in the audience. She was one of the hosts. So um, she was one of the hosts. So imagine American Idol. So there's three judges got and the hosts. So I was Ryan Seacrest. She was one of the hosts. Okay. And then so she always kind of remembered. Did, did, were you following Garrett or uh, Warrior? Not. I didn't really follow him after that. I knew of him. I knew what Warrior was, but I didn't follow the message. Okay. So what was your reaction when you got the ticket? How did you buy this? I knew. I knew about Warrior Week. I knew what it cost. I knew we didn't have the money to do that. So I didn't know that there was even this possibility. 
And then and then she says she got it somehow. And what what uh, how far was Warrior Con from uh, from the dates that she gave you the tickets? About five weeks. Five weeks. So what happened during that five weeks, man? Well, it was Memorial Day. Uh huh. Was our very first lead up training. Uh huh. And it was with you. And so I went into my office and I remember I popped on the computer and you know I, I had no idea what to expect. And so I popped on, you know, it's our virtual live training and yeah. And you just started talking and it just, it hit me right in the heart. And I, I lived my life. I really believed for a long, long time that I was a very, very honest man. Mm -hmm. I really am. I feel like I'm a pure good hearted man. Yes. But warrior showed me that I hid behind a lot of lies, Mm -hmm. not like in your face lies, like I'm lying to you, but to myself. Yes. And so it, it opened up this I mean, just r- not rude, but this beautiful awakening for myself to to find myself over the past nine months. Shit! If uh, so, really, it was it like when she bought the ticket for you? The training started a couple of days later, and 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 if not, I wonder what that gap would have caused you to do, right? Ah, maybe I'll go later. Well, eh, whatever, or whatever, right? There, there was that gap, but it got pu- it got pulled you in virtually in the training. So that kind of connected with you as as you were part of the training every day. <clears throat> what was happening to you? Did, did you still want to go to, to the apartment? Did you still want to? Or you kind of put that on pause to see what, what's going to happen with this shit? I, I had faith. Because, I, again, I'd see what he had done to those people in six hours. Yeah. So I she had explained to me what was going to happen, what we were going to, and... I honestly, I, I called the apartment that night and I canceled my lease. Okay. So okay. I so, ne- so never you, left. So then, so really the tickets fucking changed everything. It changed our entire life. Holy balls again. But okay. All right. So you get the tickets, you come to Warrior Con, um, you know, you go through the training. I think I pulled you up a couple of times live. We dealt with you and you, you now have a new reality, new sets of reality in your hand and you come to the event uh, five day event, th- three or four day event, and then uh, what happens then? It was um, again. She actually came with me, which was awesome. Um, so she stayed in the hotel room when I was yeah. there all day. And it was the the second night. I remember. Do you remember the story about how Garrett had told his team how there was going to be this something was going to happen, this radical shift? Yeah. And that was certified trainer. Yes. Right. Yes. And so <clears throat> that night, I came home with our with our sheet of paper to you know I can join Warrior Leader. And so I was pondering that because in my life, I've never invested in myself. Yep. Hence me being such, you know, never even considering worry week as a possibility for $10,000 you know, or whatever it was back then. It was never even a reality for me. So even considering this $5,000 investment for warrior leader yep. was not, I mean, I, I mean, I knew I, I felt it inside me. Like I, this is something that it pulled me, mm-hmm. but I, I laid there at night and I, I was kind of tossing and turning about it. And I got up the next morning, and we had gotten that email about leader, um, licensee, and certified trainer. Yes. And so I was talking to her about it in the morning, and um, she goes, well, you're going to do certified trainer, right? And I'm like, yeah. And I, which is a, a huge leap, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's a huge leap, and I'm stressing about $5,000. Yes. Now we're talking about five times that amount. Um, so she gives you take ticket. She gives you, she gives you the, the 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 certainty to go for something that most of your life you wouldn't even fucking dare looking at. And it's funny how like putting five thousand dollars or ten thousand, whatever the fucking amount, it's funny how we would put that into material. Like I, I remember I bought a desk one time. It was fucking thirty five hundred to put in my office. I'm like, what the fuck. Thirty-five fucking hundred dollar for a desk. Now I know there's thirty-five thousand dollar desk as well. So you know if you're sitting there and you're watching this podcast and you're like, homie, you know thirty-five hundred is not that much. Listen, back in the days that was a lot of fucking money for me to pay on a fucking desk. So for me, it's a big ass fucking commitment to pay thirty-five hundred for a desk, so that I, I, I that didn't really bring any fucking value into my life other than okay, I have this material now, and cars. Most of us guys w- would put in that amount of dollars into cars. Ah, okay, I'll pay it monthly, whatever, you know, $5,000 more for this option. 
I'll buy the I'll buy the seats. I'll buy this. But it, it just there is justification as Shamsin when it comes to material, but when it comes to the investment to ourselves for ourselves, we always come last. I always came last. I mean, I bought nice cars. I bought nice houses. You know, I'm in real estate. You know, I've always invested in nice things. Yeah. And but myself, I never did it because, again, I hid behind these stories that my life was good. Right. That I didn't need the help. And, and, and the material that you have, the position that we have, kind of makes that okay to say that. Like it kind of it comes in and it supports, it, supports, it supports the fucking argument, right? You look at your life, right? You're the average guy, right? Most of your life. You look at your life. Okay, I got the house. I got a beautiful house. Dude, listen, you know, not everybody has a fucking house. I hustle. I grind. I got the fucking house. I got the house. I got the house. I got the, ho- I got the house, right? Then I got the car. Like, I got the sport car, I got the SUV, I got the fucking van or whatever, the motorcycle, I got the boat, and I got, so I get these things. I get the second home, vacation home, I get the the condominium, I get, like, I get things, right? And at the end of the day, you look at this and you're like, well, fuck, if I have all this, it's because I've done something right. I've achieved some shit. So, but you never question the idea of, you, like, you. When did you invest the last time in you? All, all these things that you acquired, the house, the cars, and all the tools, and the toys, it has always been a, a false hope. It's a hook that is not necessarily yours, but you, you clinch on it. And so you're able to climb a little bit. It's what you show to the rest of the world, right? That's what you hang your hat on. That's what they can see but they don't see inside you. And that, that approval, it's almost like everything in our lives. The approval for others to see what we have, so therefore in their eyes we get a reflection that we are actually someone, only to find out that behind, behind, our, behind our faces, they're actually saying this guy is a fucking asshole, fuck him. But yet we look for that confirmation that I live in this neighborhood, that I got this house, that I have this status in this company, right? People respect me. I got the special parking, the boss's parking, and the manager's fucking parking. And that that false status comes in and supports the questions that we need to ask ourselves, which is like, really, who am I? And who I don't, who I want to become? Who I want to become continuously? So I, did the, I didn't do it as much with the materialistic things, but I've told you this story, Stan, so people that are listening, so I am, or I have been a single father for a long time. Um, I got sole custody of my son, Noah, when he was two. Yeah. And I raised him, um, he saw his mom until, she, until he was four. Okay, he's 13 now. He hasn't seen his mom in nine years. And from until he was four until, I was, until he was nine, as that's when I met Letha, it was literally just me and him. Yes. And so that is what I hung my hat on. It wasn't on the, the success at real estate. It wasn't on the houses I owned. Sure. It wasn't on that stuff. It was that, hey, I'm a single dad. This is what I took Noah. I'm raising Noah on my own. And so that, you're, you're a fucking hero. I am a hero. So I'm a hero. I'm a single dad. I'm a role model. And in, inside of that, I don't question. I don't question anything else and I don't dare let you question me yeah because here's what I'm going to show you on social media me and Noah at the park me and Noah at a baseball game me and Noah at this me and Noah at that but we don't see Mike being drunk every day we don't see Mike fucking losing his temper and screaming and yelling and being a fucking asshole because I don't show that shit right yeah because that, that would not do very good to my perception so single dad is the fact you take the fact and you build a goddamn fucking story around it to make yourself the hero of the fucking story. So I'm the single dad, I run with the facts, but I'm the single dad, and then single dad, I give myself permission to do all the other shit as long as I remain the single dad in the front line. <laughs> and it, it literally ran my life. <clears throat> and you know, you're sharing this because the whole point of this conversation is that if you're listening to this and you're watching this and you're a fucking single dad, 
And if you've given yourself praise so far because you're a single dad and you've done all these incredible things with your kids and you took them out, you spent time with them, and you're an awesome father, that's great. But what about the shitty stuff? How come no one talks about the shitty stuff that you've done as a dad? Like, you don't even talk to yourself about that. Like, literally, you can't even look yourself in the mirror and, and start listing 10 of the most shittiest thing that you've done to your wife, or in this case, since you're a single fucking dad, to your kids in the past 15 days. In the past 15 days, top 10 list of shittiest thing you've done to your kids. Most people won't deal with that, with that, with this simple fucking instruction. Here's an evolution. Go look at yourself in the fucking mirror. Review the past 15 days and write down the top 10 most shittiest thing that you've done to your kids. Most people will not write anything on the mirror. In fact, most people will not even stand and look at the mirror and say, fuck, to this, fuck you to this podcast, fuck you to this conversation, and fuck off. I don't want to hear this shit. Like, I don't. Right? Because, listen, motherfucker, I'm a single dad. I got to go fucking work, and I got to spend time with my kids. I got my shit covered. I don't need to listen to some fucking guy that actually interrupts my pattern, my beautiful fucking pattern, only to avoid the fucking pain and misery of being alone inside of that game and being a pretender, being somebody that you, you're you actually not. That's the worst thing. It was, it was a... It was a, it was pretend. The things I did for Noel were not pretend. Of course not. But the, the fact that I just hid behind it. The totality was a fucking pretending. Like the beauty and the work that you've done as a father, that remains at its place. But you had to hide the rest. You had to hide your sexual desires. You had to hide your sexual fantasies. You had to hide your being drunk. You had to hide like any other fucking thing that would go against the image of a single dad. I did, and alcohol was my pit. And it was, I believe it was 2007. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend that was we hung out every day. And back in 2007, I had a similar story as every other motherfucker in real estate who made a million dollars with their eyes closed, right? So I literally didn't do anything and was making money. So we would literally just drink every day. And one day my friend came in the house, in my house, and he had a bottle of vodka in his hand. And he just walked in and he set the bottle of vodka on the counter and he grabbed a glass, he poured a little shot of vodka in the glass and then he poured a little Sprite and then he drank it. Mm. And then he set it down and then he poured another shot of vodka in the glass and a little more Sprite and then he drank it. Mm -hmm. And then he put the bottle in the corner. And I'm like, what the fuck? Mm. Like what? What did you just do? Yeah, he's like, dude, I, just, I do that every day. It just it, like it, it just takes the edge off. I don't. That, I just do two shots and I'm just good. Okay. So what does Mike do? Two shots, of course. And then what does Mike do for the next ten years? Two shots. Two shots. You wouldn't go for the whole bottle, but two shots. Some days was the whole bottle. Okay. Oh, so let's talk about that fucking pattern, right? Because I'm in that mix too. Let's talk about that pa pattern. Let's talk about the pattern of two shots. When you would take the shoot two shots, what would happen? I would instantly feel good in literally less than five minutes. It would hmm. just, it would all go away. And, and what were the feelings that you had prior to that, let's say? Just the stress of work and the deals going on. You know, at, in 2007, 8, and 9 when shit yeah, fell yeah, apart, yeah, yeah. that's when it all went bad. So, so, so you hit. drink it, right? And then, and then kind of like your mind is somewhere else yeah it's sedation right it's just it all goes TV. away i didn't do a lot of that well and that's a fucking lie no i did i did netflix yeah. you know i could watch a series in a weekend right I'd get drunk and, and what would you what would make you go to three four and five and six and the whole bottle half a bottle more stress or a desire to be to be a desire to be farther and farther away got it so i i quit drinking in 2008 uh, it wasn't really a fucking special event. It just fucking happened. I had to move to another country to work. In fact, it was Africa. And uh, and I'm like, no fucking way I'm drinking here, bro. Like, I got to be alert. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so um, so three months turned into six months um, to a year. It was fucking just one of those habits. And now it's 10 years. Uh, but I remember a decade of drinking 
and a decade of drinking based on a pattern and routine. And my pattern and routine was very different. So on Fridays and on Saturdays, it was drinking so that I can socially go out. They, that, so the, 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 the clubbing and the dancing and just going to the club scene was associated with me being drunk before. Because if I was not drunk before, then I could not be the clown or I could not be the guy that is likable or I could not see myself as a guy operating in that environment. Maybe I was shy or maybe I just wanted to be liked. Whatever that was, that the alcohol was giving me that. And it wasn't small quantities. There was certain quantities that would put me in that state. If I would go more, I would fuck it up. If I would less, I wouldn't get it, so I would be frustrated. So it had to be like, I, you know, I remember exactly how it was, it was half a bottle, right? Half a but if it would go to three quarter, I would be fucked up. So half a bottle was 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 the deal, and so the drinking would happen at home, and then the departure would go to the club. That was that was a that was like a, I was not the type of guy that would drink the half a bottle at the clubs. Back in the days, having the the, the balls in the clubs were not that popular. Today it is, so it's fine. So you like you go there and you spend the extra money, and the, but so the drink would happen socially at home. But I'm sharing this with you because this is a pattern on Saturday and Sunday. So I would say that, hey man, I drink on the weekend like just anybody. For fucking years, I use this fucking excuse that, hey man, are you, uh, hey man, you drink a lot? No, I just just like everybody on the weekend when we go out. Okay, cool. Like it, it was okay to have a check mark around it if you would position it that way. Justification. Yeah, man. And then I'll look back and I'm like, okay, damn. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, my patterns were different. My patterns was six pack of beer and then salsa and chips or some shit with it that that like some pleasant combination, right? Beer and chips and beer and some other chicken wings or whatever that went with that. But I'm like, okay, I would go on Monday. Like there was not one day that I would not drink. Now I know that would, those five days I would not be as as drunk as party mode as Saturday and Friday and Saturday. Even Sunday I would fucking drink at my parents' house. All day, wine or whatever, all kind of shit. So I look back and really. The story that I had is like, okay, well, motherfucker, maybe you were a fucking guy that was drinking every day. And whether you want to call that a functional alcoholic or not, or whatever the fuck label you want to put at it, that was the case for 10 years. You did the following. These are the facts. You drank Saturday and Friday. That happened. Clubbing was happening Saturday and Sunday. When I was not with my wife, that was happening. And when I got married, that was still happening. So it didn't stop. Part of that, five days during the week, the drinking would happen. It would be a minimum of one beer to six or seven. Maybe sometimes some wine, but and then the wine and all that shit would be on Sunday. So the facts were for fucking 10 years, I drank every day. Yep. Even if I didn't, I, I came home late one day because it was like working, right? All the way to like 1130 at night. I drank at lunch. I had one beer. I would do it where if I came home late, I would still grab the bottle and just do my two shots before I went to bed for no reason. Because it, it's just check mark. Yeah, and a, a habit, a pattern. But, you know, I, I had a different kind of a justification similar to yours. Yeah. But, but mine, I call it the 95-5 rule. So 95% of the time, those two shots made Mike pretty fucking awesome. Yeah. He was pretty cool. And then 5% of the time, it was drunk, blackout, nightmare yeah. Mike. Yeah, and there was some. I mean, there's some really ridiculous stories out there about blackout drunk Mike, and and those were the ones that were just you know I risked my life, I risked my family's life, not I mean physically sometimes, but also just in every which way. I mean, I could have been arrested, I could have been killed. Dude, I fucking risked my my life and my wife's life for fucking ten years by being a drunk ass sleeping at night. Not knowing who the fuck is going to knock on my door and kind of come into my house at three in the morning. And my ass is too drunk to be alert and to know who the fuck is in my house. For sure. So, for like, I can sit here and say, hey, man, you know, I used to drink 
And uh, I was a weekend drinker. Eh, one or two beers during the week or whatever. Can't even count it because I wasn't drunk during the week. But then the reality is every night I had alcohol in my fucking blood. And scientifically, I was fucking slower than if I wouldn't have alcohol in my blood. The nights that I was blacked out, you were blacked out. Like, that's blackout. Black motherfucking out. You're out. Useless. Useless. Like, you're fucking out. That means a fucking stranger can come in your house, rape your wife, rape your fucking children, and you motherfucker decided to be what? Blackout. A grown-ass man next to the fucking bathroom decided to be blacked out. By choice. Way too often. Dude, like I, I, I close my eyes and I go back to all the number of times I was blacked out. And it's a fucking miracle that I'm fucking sitting here. Like physically, physically, I could have died 20 times in blackouts. Driving, all kind of fucking, like not knowing, like, like just lost, completely like falling in the snow and waking up in the next morning in the middle of the fucking snow. It was a fucking crazy story. One of my coworkers, this is a true fucking story. One of my coworkers, he would, he would have the same pattern, like drink every night, but it was just heavy beer. So he goes out one night, drinks, and comes back home, and he comes and falls in into the snow right in front of his door, like literally three feet away from his door. He wakes up in the morning, and he can't feel his fingers. He didn't have gloves, so, it's, it's, so the, the whole night his hands were in the fucking snow. He was wearing whatever, right, like jackets and all that shit. So he goes into the ER and they chopped these three fingers on both hands. So he was he was like this. His name was fucking Ryan. He would he would fucking type in with these two hands. I would see that guy every day and it was a reminder. A reminder of fuck. That's the price of blackout, man. Yeah, we're lucky we didn't pay that price. Dude, I don't know if we're lucky or I think Somebody was watching over us. Yeah, I. Today is uh, I am ninety five days sober. Yeah, hey, good shit, man. So um, I made that choice. I even when I came to Warrior, I I really I, I cut back a lot. Hey, it's the ninety five percent rule, right? <laughs> I better ninety five days. You feel like fucking awesome. I, I feel good. Let's not let's not go back. But like I really cut back a lot. Yeah. From from Warrior Con till December first. Yeah. I quit December first. The day I asked Letha to marry me, I quit. Yes. Um but even in those six months, there was still, you know, a handful of, of opportunities. Of out of control times. Fuck yeah. It wasn't once a week or once a month even, but there was a handful of of, of times. Yes. And even even once is too many. That's why I finally realized even one time to risk that is too much. Yes. So I finally just said, fuck it. Just stop. Yeah. Um, you come to Warrior Week as part of the experience. Uh, you you want to be a certified trainer, so you have to come to Warrior Week in, in order to experience Warrior Week itself. And then the training begins, obviously, for a long period of time. Uh, so you come to Warrior Week, and the first night we take you to this, this place called the fucking pit. What what did you face in your pit? Like what did what were you forced to see where dude you'd never even fucking knock that, that door anywhere else? I just I saw I saw Letha and the kids. And again, I think I think I am a great example of the fucking guy that needs to come to Warrior Week that doesn't always come to Warrior Week. Because there's not that glaring need right it's not just you know there's a lot of people out there that are you know maybe cheating on their wives or that there's some drastic thing that you're here and that's your pit again i i made some money i was you know, i had a nice i have a beautiful son i had a beautiful girlfriend on the surface it all looked pretty good so until you really give yourself permission right to actually open up and actually look at that pit then it gets pretty fucking ugly. Then that's when you realize the 95 five rule. That's when you realize your business is honestly a joke. It's just 
luck. You know, that's when you realize your your relationship you've been in for three and a half years was, was literally hanging on by a thread. And I had the choice. You know, at WarriorCon, I had a choice to make a change and lose my family or make a change and risk and not lose my family or stay how I am and for sure lose my family. So, you know, men come to Worry Week, um, some because they feel the pain of the lies that they're facing or that they're telling. And that could be maybe they're cheating on their wife. So at the end of the day, cheating is a glorified fucking word and just saying lying. They're just fucking lying, they're lying. Um, or maybe they've been cheated on, so been lied to. And it's not only a matter of cheating. Some some are just disconnected, disconnected from God, disconnected from their bodies. This like just simply having it all seems to be true, but they don't feel it. Like they have the wife and the kids and the family, and and but they don't feel happiness. They feel like taking the fucking gun and putting it in their head and blowing it up. Yet they don't have the balls to even to do that. So they're in this pretty fucked up place where okay, I'd like. <laughs> Whatever, I like. I'm ready to burn this shit down, so I actually have some action. And they do burn some shit down. They make some stupid decisions and so on, or they get numbed out in that area. So that's that's the that's the guy, right? That's the guy that lives the lie, right? And it's somehow aware of it because of the conversation of warrior. And then there is, there is a guy that comes in and that has a normal life, everything is good, and lives on a bigger even fucking lie that everything is okay, and and like. Everything is not okay because the lies that you were told, they date back so many fucking years that your mind decided to pack these fucking lies and put them in the box and not think about it, not knowing that these particular lies is what actually have affected most of your life and is holding you back. In your particular case, uh, and, and this is a place to fucking tell this story because the story needs to go to the universe. You were lied to. Like, you were violated. Your trust was fucking violated. It was violated and it happened years back. Years back, Michael was a nice guy and Michael trusted someone and that person fucking violated your fucking trust. That's a trauma that the modern man ignores. The modern man is tough. The modern man lives in a world of social media. The modern man lives in a world where everything is in the front line and everything is an inside. A world of fucking pretender. Not wanting to connect to those traumas or saying, well, a man is not a man is supposed to take it in, man. I'm not going to be a fucking pussy and think about that. It's over. I'm going to have a positive attitude around this. I'm not going to think about the past. I'm going to focus my energy on the future. And yet, live miserably fucking now. That's the conversation. I'm not going to think about the past. I'm going to focus on the future and accept that I should live fucking miserably now. So fuck me because the future is going to be nicer. But fuck me today. Yet, I'm not going to cry about the past. That's the modern man. And here at Warrior, we say, fuck you, modern man. Like, you're a fucking liar, modern man. And today's social media, today's technology has done exactly what it's pretending to do. It, it, it's just like technology and social media. It's another fucking lie. It says that, hey, man, we're here to connect you. Yet it's, it's about this fucking connection. There is a disconnection to the human sides. And there is a connection to the fantasy land. I'm not a person that's against technology or social media. There is a context that this could be used, but currently it's out of fucking context. It is out of control. It is out of fucking context. It's, a, it's an entity by itself. It lives by itself. Social media is an entity. Just like corporate America became an entity, companies became an entity. A person that with rights and, and they can actually dictate shit. Social media has become that. And, and we can sit here and fucking ignore all this shit. Or we can look at this and the effect that has on me, on your wife, on my wife, on my kids. Everyone, as we speak, are fucking affected by this entity. All of them. 
And the disconnection is promoted through connection. Connect, yet disconnect humanly. So inside of that, let's go back. And let's go back to that particular incident where your fucking trust was violated. I want you to tell me the story like as, as it was taking place. Well, I, the, the, the person I originally, that I think of instantly is, is Noah's mother. Of course. And she had her issues. And, and again, I, I can blame her all I want, but it comes back to me because I was, I was the savior. That's what Mike has done his whole life. Mike has, again, Mike is the good guy, right? Mike, just what you just got done saying, I'll take it in, I'll take all the heat. But I, I would keep on going back to her even though after she would hurt me. Mm -hmm. And so as much as I want to blame her, I need to look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, she cheated on me over and over and over. I mean, she was, she was actually married the entire time we were mm -hmm. dating, and mm -hmm. I didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually I found out she was married the, the week after Noah was born. Mm -hmm. I went to get the birth certificate yeah. from the hospital, and they wouldn't give it to me. Because they said, well, the mother lied on the paternal affidavit. Yeah. And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, she said she wasn't married. Well, she's not married. Well, yeah, she is. And in the state of Arizona, they presume then, because she was married, that that is not my son. Yeah. So I had to go through Hell. paternity testing and everything to prove that Noah was my son. I mean, it's ridiculous. And yet I still took her back. Yeah. And so, again, can I be mad at her for doing shitty fucking things to me? Of course I can but I, I need to be more aware of myself and why do I do those things and allow people to do those things to me and, and allow them to come back. Yeah. So that wasn't the worst lie that she told you. Man, she's told so many. Um, when, when she got sick? Yeah, so... When we, this was when I first started dating, before Noah was even a thought. Um, we, we moved in together. I just moved to Arizona. Mm. And we moved into an apartment up in, in North Phoenix. And I'd been here for about a year, mm. or in Phoenix for about a year. And I'm from Minnesota. And she told me that she had breast cancer. And Mike, of course, Mike wants to help her. Yes. And so I would drive her to the Mayo Clinic yes. once a week, and she would go in. She wouldn't let me come in. Now it all makes sense, but she wouldn't actually let me come in. She would go there, and I would wait for her in the parking lot, and she would come back out. And this went on for a few weeks, and at that time in our life, I decided that I wanted to move back to Minnesota. Yeah. I miss my family. I miss my friends. I was the only one here. When I came to Arizona, I didn't know anybody. Yeah. I just got my car and drove here. Yeah. And so I, made, I gave her an ultimatum. I said, hey, you and Connor, that's her son Connor, you guys can come back and live with me and my parents as long as you promise to go to the Mayo Clinic up in Rochester. Rochester, Minnesota has a great hospital. Yes. And so she agreed. So I move her back. This is in, this is right around Halloween. And we couldn't get an appointment until February. So we live in my parents' basement for two and a half months. Wow. My whole family knows, my grandparents, I mean, everybody knows what's going on. And everybody's taking care of her. Taking care of her pity, you know, concern, compassion, you know, all Everything. the things. And the night before we're supposed to go, I walk downstairs and she is in tears, like uncontrollably sobbing. And I expected because she's scared, right? I mean, that's a, it's a big thing. She's actually going to go and get this dealt with. And so I sit down next to her and I'm, you know, consoling her and she looks at me, she's like, I have to tell you something. I'm like, okay. And she looks me right in the eyes and she says, I don't have cancer. <laughs> and my heart literally just, it dropped. You would think that'd be, a, again, it'd be happy because she doesn't have cancer, but my heart dropped because of the embarrassment. Of course. That I, I, had to, I had to walk upstairs and tell my parents who I care so much about, my whole family that had dealt with her for three months, that she had been literally lying to us and taking advantage of us. And we had, we'd been raising her son and it was, it was the hardest thing I've ever done as far as telling them up at that point in my life. So two, two fucking, uh, uh, in, in the midst of all this shit going on in the storm in this relationship and like to your point, 
There's no one to fucking blame, man. It, it, it's just simply a fucking pile of shit. And two people are swimming in it. Like, diving deep, going deep, holding your breath, coming up. Diving deeper and deeper, staying deep in the shit and diarrhea, and then coming up. And grasp air, but swallow some shit, because there was a wave of shit that hits your face, and then go back. So, so that becomes the relationship. Two people swimming in a pile of fucking shit. And inside of that, two particular events kind of like broke your heart into fucking pieces and no one knew about it. First is the, is the lie about the cancer, because if she can lie about this, then what else she can lie about, right? Hearts gets fucking pieces. Somehow you put it all together. You take some shit, you put it on your heart, and the shit glues all the pieces of the heart that is broken. So you now have a broken heart with pieces of shit in between that is actually putting it together. You go on. You feel the misery. And then the shit that happened with the birth certificate of your child. Like, you go in, you want to get the birth certificate of the child. It's this, this amazing moment that you just experienced only to find out that this, what the fuck? Yeah, it was again, it was... So it... To, to finish off the, the cancer story, I I sent her and her son home the next day. Yeah, like I was that was that was the breaking point. Yeah, so I, at least I have some respect for myself. I did send her home, and we were broken up for about a year. Yeah, a year and a half because I stayed in Minnesota for about a year, and then I actually went back to to Phoenix. Yeah, and we ended up getting back together, obviously, because we had Noah. Um, but yeah, so then we dated again, and then we had Noah, and we weren't really even together when we yeah. had Noah. So just kind of happened. Just yeah. So, uh, you know, above all this, you swim in shit. Now you're on the beach and the ocean, the crystal blue water with your beautiful wife and your son. And, and you're in a good place now. But there was a period of time that you did swim in fucking shit. And that there was some big waves that you had to go just underneath. Or you'd be taken by a big wave of shit. And you were taken by some wave of shit. And all that brought you to this place because... Noah is here. Mm -hmm. If you look back, if this wouldn't, with this woman would never be in your life, or if you would never, or if she would never tell you the lie about the cancer and you kicking her out and somehow reconnecting, not really based on love, but based on "Hey man, how you doing?" type of thing after a year and a half, and Noah comes out of all this. So when you look back, blame, anger, whatever the fuck you want to call it, it was all fucking worth it. 100%. And you come to Warrior Week, you process this, and you go home. And you're back home to the woman that sent you to Worry Week, to the woman that supported you for this. You had no fucking idea you're going to be here. It was all her. Like, she kept supporting you because she saw something in you. You go back two days later, 10 at night, I look at my phone, you're calling me. And I pick up the phone, we have a two hour conversation. Take us through what the fuck happened. We went, I went home and you know, it doesn't change overnight, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I told this story on, on Facebook one time, like we as men, as we start to make this change, we can feel it inside. Like I am, I am confident that I am a changed man from yes. June. Yes. But when you do something for so long, you know, you may say it's your wife or your kids or your parents, you know, if you do it for a week, a month, a year, just because you don't do it one time, that doesn't mean shit. Mm. So it's going to take time for that to go away, for them to, to gain that trust. And we just, we hadn't got there yet. And, yeah. and so I was expecting more than that. And she wasn't there yet. You know, it, it just wasn't happening. So talk about what specifically happened. Like you were in fucking tears, man. We were, we were, it was, we were going to break up again. But it wasn't you. Was it you? Was it you that said let's break up or was it no, her? No, it, it was her. Yeah. Yeah. So. so I remember you particularly telling me, dude, like I just went through this whole experience. I just, all this. And she's like telling me that, you know, fuck this, this is not going to work. I wasn't because this was probably now. So we did 
the lead up to Warrior Council was May 16th or whatever. Yeah. We started yeah. Like, Memorial Mason. Day. And now we went to Warrior Week in July. Yeah. So now we're talking about two months. Two okay? months, yeah. Two months of doing the work. Yeah. And it wasn't so. <laughs> her whole thing with me is then, again, that I was so blinded is I have this ginormous ego. Yeah. Uh-huh. And she couldn't understand how I couldn't fucking see it. Yeah. And it just, it drove her crazy how I could stand on this fucking pedestal and cast stones on everybody. Yeah. yeah, And and not see my own stories. And she just, she was fed up. She was, dude, she was ready to fucking go the way you described it. She was done. Like you were in fucking tears. You're like, what the fuck? Like I did everything so I, so that I was the one that was walking away and I got the ticket. And now I've gone through the work and she's, she's going away. What the fuck that I've done wrong. And, and you and I have a conversation and you did something that night. I wrote her a letter. Okay. Talk to me about that. I just wrote her. I I honestly, I can't even remember what it says now, but it was just again from the heart that I am going to change. Why, why, why did you let wrote a letter? Well, one, because I'm not a good communicator. Um, I, I lose my temper, and when I hear something I don't like to hear, mm-hmm. then I, I put my defenses up. Um, so a letter got let me get it out on paper, and it let her take it in yep. without me fucking it up. Yep. So I wrote her, you know, for me, a long letter, about a three-page letter, yep. and wrote out everything that I had feelings about and that I was going to try to do and that, that she deserved and that, you know, I was doing this for her. And I actually just today I texted believe that no one cold and I texted a picture of myself and said hey I'm going to California again for the sixth time mm-hmm. in six months I'm leaving you guys to go work on myself and I said but it's for you yeah I'm doing this for you everything I do every morning so 213 days in a row I've woken up and done my stack and my core four mm-hmm. I don't miss I do the work yeah and I do it for them every single fucking day yeah I won't, I won't miss because I, I won't miss for them because I will become the best version of Mike that I can be because they deserve it. Beautiful. And so y- you, you write this letter. Let's talk about the fucking letter, okay? So in today's world, um, dialogues are not really happening. People don't fucking talk because, again, the, what, what is supposed to connect us is actually disconnecting us, which is social media and technology. And so... Uh, even texts don't people don't feel the text. There's no feeling around the text because it's just too quick and it, it is a uh, it is um, it's, it's just immediate gratification, right? So you think about videos. Yeah, videos are cool. Videos are pretty cool. Uh, not everybody wants to go on video, and sometimes on video you're more exposed than what you write. So you think about an old school fucking letter, old school letter, which you allow your feeling to flow for your wife does two things one gives you the space to say what the fuck you have to say without her interrupting you and changing your flow you're talking about relationship she will talk about why you didn't fucking put the shoes inside of the uh you know the the shoe holder and you're like what the fuck does have everything to do and she will say well you know it has to do everything because you don't clean after yourself you don't that and suddenly like we're not we're not talking about the flow like your flow is completely fucking raped you want to talk about relationship and intimacy, next thing you know, you're picking a fight for all kind of topics that don't make any fucking sense. But th- there is a sense of frustration on her end that causes you to, to send this all these, we call them nagging, but it, it's essentially it's just signals that something is off, something is not in balance. So inside of that, a letter allows you to express your flow. And like you said beautifully, it allows her to receive it without interruption. Um, and this is something that all of you guys, I mean, if you're listening to podcasts right now and, and you feel like, uh, uh, you know, you're just like stuck, you're stuck in your communication with your wife, you are stuck because you don't have a way to communicate with her because you're fucking fed up of every time talking to her that this fucking conversation turns out to be a fucking fight over things that don't fucking matter. And then you snap and you start screaming or you do some fucking stupid shit. Then you're left with the feelings of guilt and shame, maybe for fucking days, maybe the whole night. Perhaps you go drink two shots of vodka to smooth things out. 
If that's your case, if the, the, if if th this is the scenario that you're dealing with, if conversating with your wife seems to be impossible, this person that is the most important person in your life, you're having difficulties expressing yourself or you're not in the mood to talk to your wife. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Not in the mood because I'm stressed out or because I've worked. So what, motherfucker? There needs to be a game of transition that happens for the modern man. And that's what's missing today. The game of transition is the following. You work your ass off, and when you come home, you transition to dad and husband, and you work your ass off. And then the next morning, you wake up, you go to the gym, or you work out, and you work your ass off as the fucking athlete. And then you come back, and you sit down, and you connect with God and you pray or whatever communication that you choose to have with God. And you work your ass off there too. And then you transition to work. And then you produce as a motherfucker. You go there and you produce. And then you transition. Above all this, at one point, you transition to fucking sleep. And rest. But we are missing the transition game, man. Modern man is not a master of transition. That's why the modern man is fucked. They get blurred, right? You bring it home. The yeah. mastery of transition. And it's not fucking hard. You're a salsa dancer? Great, man. Dance fucking salsa. But when you come here, you got to do break dance. Transition from salsa to break dance. And then you go to merengue, and then you go to belly dancing. You have to have the transition ability as a fucking dancer. Between belly dancing to fucking break dancing to salsa and merengue. It's four different modality that as a man, we have to play. You want to dance? Let's go. You better be a fucking good transitioner. Because being a good dancer just in salsa, guess what? Not enough. You're good at salsa. The end. But you're not the dancer. And your wife married a dancer. Your kids want a dancer. They want someone that can transition and dance between the chapters of life, between work and business, between taking care of your body and weaponizing, before connect, between connecting with God and having that power spiritually put into you and your line of production, man, and your loved ones and taking care of your kids and, 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 and your wife. And this is a game of transition. We are missing fucking transition. And all warrior is, warrior week, this experience that you're part of, certified trainer, who you've become as a man today sitting here. All that is, is that you played the game of transition for 213 days and you didn't take a break. You didn't say today I'm not going to transition. You played the game of transition, and that's why you're sitting here, and that's why you're, you're, like, you're on the beach, man. Crystal blue water with your family in it. And it's, a, it's, it's work every day, right? It's, 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 it's never, it never stops. Nope. You always have to transition. And even, even today, you know, I'm, I'm super fucking busy. Yep. And it's, it's very easy to not transition. It's very easy to say, well, fuck, I'm, I'm going to come home late tonight. <laughs> I can I can play with the kids tomorrow. And I'm guilty of that. I mean, I am. I'm too, man. Like right now. Right now. Right now, it's eight at night. We're recording this shit, right? Yeah. I'm, so I'm, I, I'm in I, a different state. You're in a different state. You traveled. It's eight at nine. We're going to go grab a bite. By the time I go home, like, we are guilty of that. But here's the reality. Tomorrow morning, when I drop my son to school, I got 20 minutes. You bet your ass I'm going to be in fucking master of transition that 20 minutes. Like, I'm going to... So here's the problem. Most people drive the fucking kids in school, and they don't even fucking talk to the kid in the car, man. They're stressed about how to get to the school line and how to make sure that they get in and get out by a certain time. Like, they're just fucking stressed about the school line. They get super stressed about the fucking the drop line. You can't go to the other line, and there's cars in the back, and... We worry about the stupidest shit. Stupidest shit. So my time is consumed tonight, but tomorrow morning, you bet your ass that I'm going to fucking transition to a dad. And then I'll come back and transition to a wife, make my wife some breakfast, make her a green smoothie or whatever. Right? So the game of transition is not the game of time. 
Whatever. Fun. You can say that you spend so much time with your kids and it still doesn't matter because you're not teaching them shit. You spend so much time with them only to tell them to go learn from the teachers, only to tell them to go to learn from the coaches, only to tell them to go to learn from the preachers, only to tell them to go to learn from Tom, Dick, and Harry on fucking YouTube and Internet. Like the biggest lie the modern man is telling himself that I'm spending time. I took my son to the baseball game for two hours. Yeah, motherfucker, you put him in the car. You didn't talk to him. When you went there, you bought a beer, you bought a hot dog, and you were checking out the ass of all the moms that were there. You didn't even watch your son. You picked him up. You told him good job. You brought him back. You didn't talk to him. You were on your fucking phone, and then you dropped him home, and you went downstairs, and you jerked off. Put a tap on your shoulder. Great. Modern man. Well, I love my son. I know. And he loves baseball. I know. Why? Because his mom put him in there? Okay. And I drive him for two hours. We have this special time. This is our time. Really? This is your time. No connection there. You can take five minutes and you can build a, a, a massive amount of memory with your kids that will beat years of you bringing, bringing them to fucking baseball practice and volleyball practice and all kind of shit that we put our kids through. Reality is, like, they, they don't need to go through all these structured programs. They don't. They need you to spend time with them. What if instead of fucking putting them in baseball, you play baseball with them? One of the, one of the, my favorite things you've ever said to us at anything is the simple phrase of love plus fun equals connection. And I actually had that conversation with a gentleman today, and he's talking about how he's been doing just what you've been saying. He's been spending the time with his kids, and but he's he doesn't feel connected. And I said, it doesn't have to be anything. You don't have to take him somewhere. It can be an imaginary game of fucking sword fight. It can be draw a picture. It can be anything. They don't give a shit hmm. as long as you're present. As long as you're there and you're connected with them and it's fun for them, they don't give a shit. And that's the shit they're going to remember. Yeah, for sure. People think that they have to kid their kids to all these fucking vacations. But they don't give a fuck where they are as long as they have fun at when you are there. All they want is mom and dad. Like they don't they don't know anybody else. They don't give a fuck about anything else. As they get older, okay, I get it and the game changed, but that's still even when they get older. And I'm not really in a place to, to fucking talk about that because my son is only eight. So I can't really say even if they're older. But what I've seen through the guys is that even if they're older, they still want mom and dad. But they want opinion. They want guidance. They want consulting. That's what they want. They, they want they want to see power in you so they're attracted to that power. They don't want to be forced. They don't want to see force in you. They don't because they don't fucking respect force. They have access to too many opinions nowadays. Teachers, mentors, coaches, preachers, different clubs and societies, any Tom, Dick, and Harry on the internet. Access where they can share, not feel alone, and get some fucking guidance. You bet your ass as a fucking dad, you better beat all these people and be number one. Like your role is to beat all these people and be number one on the list so that your kids come and consult you for everything. You become the number one consultant in your kid's life at any age for any topic. You do that, then today is a good day. And that requires transition. Because if you don't master the game of transition, you will not be there when they need your advice. So they'll, they'll go to the preacher. They go to the teacher. They go to the coach. They go to Tom, Dick, and Harry five seconds away from their phone. And they'll get the advice that you don't want them to get. Back in the days, we didn't have that. Like Back in the days, we had no one. It was either mom and dad that would tell us an advice or we would be stuck in a room on our own, not doing it. At best, maybe we could skip by a fucking window and head out that night and do some shit and connect with some other people and we could share some shit in that. That's it. We didn't have anywhere to go. 
Today, they have everywhere to go. So force doesn't work today. If they don't see power in you, they will not be attracted. And as long as you fucking lie, your power is dimmed, period. As long as you fucking lie about the way you feel about your marriage, the way you feel about your work, the way you feel about yourself, the way you feel about the connection with God, as long as you fucking lie, your power is dimmed. And the result and the consequences of that is your kids will not be attracted to maximum power because you're not projecting it. And there will be another force, another power where they're going to be drawn to. That's it. It's not more complicated than that. Or they're going to copy you and grow up to be a liar. A fucking liar. And I'm going to actually take the or. It's actually and. And they will do that. Because they just receive energetically what you project. So... This was this was an awesome call, man. Like this was this was an awesome conversation. Um, you know, real conversation about like pain, right? Pain that that's inside of us that for years we deny and we run with the label of single dad. Mm-hmm. Only to find out that fuck. This label that I put myself, like I put in front of myself, like pfft, there's so many lies behind the veil. And once all that goes away, like the life that you live right now, it's a life based on truth. Like, there's you're not hiding anything from your wife, for your kids. Like, everything is there, including this fucking podcast. They'll listen to this and say, hey, that's dad. And that's the pain that dad went through. There's so much power in just being able to, to say it, just to say it. Mm. When, it when you say the truth, there's nothing else you have to say. It's just the truth. Yeah. You don't have to protect it. You don't have to remember it. It's just the truth. And I fucking love it. Like I'm, I am all about the truth. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's what gives you power right now in your relationship and uh, with your wife and your kids. And it gives power to Mike. And I can feel the power. You're a powerful man sitting next to me. Uh, you're definitely not the same guy that walked in. Um, I, I can I can feel it in your words. I can see it in your eyes. I can sense it. I, I, like I'm attracted to that fucking power. When I'm like, okay, man, talk to me more, right? So that's where connection happens when people are attracted to each other's power. But if you don't project power, then pff, maybe you'll connect with someone, but it won't fucking last, guaranteed. Right. Uh, I appreciate you being on the call. If Thank you listen to this podcast and as well as to, if you watch this video and inside of this conversation, if you find anything that actually helped you move forward in your life, anything, it could have been one conversation, one word, or if there was anything that actually helped you, then you have a fucking duty and obligation to forward this podcast and this message to at least one more man that you know that could benefit from this conversation. That becomes your duty. He can download the podcast at uh, uh, on iTunes by typing in Warrior Week or on Google Play, just searching for Warrior Week, and you can subscribe to the podcast. Or you can go to warriorweeknow.com, warriorweeknow.com, where you have this episode, the other episodes, videos of it, uh, little clips, and also... Uh, scripts of the uh, different dialogues that took place and the different quotes and all kind of details on warriorweeknow.com. I encourage you to go see. Hey, man, thanks for being on the call. This was awesome. Thank you, Coach. We will see you on the next episode. Take care, everyone. (laughs)